Okay, I think we should get started. Welcome everyone to the University of Washington Fred Hutch Center for AIDS Research Lunchbox Talk Series. This talk was originally scheduled to happen this summer and then we rescheduled it. So thank you all who have made it to a new time and date to come in here, Sarah and Taylor. Um, I'm gonna give a quick bio for each of our presenters and then I'm continuing Susan Buskin, the past facilitators tradition of sharing a fun fact about each of the presenter. So I'll do that and then we will get started. Thank you for your patience. So. Sarah Shaw is a fourth year candidate in global health implementation science at the UW and a post pre-doctoral fellow with the UW STD AIDS training program. Her research interests include demonstrating how community-based participatory approaches can be combined with implementation science to address health inequities and identifying drivers of the scale up and sustainability of evidence-based interventions. Welcome, Sarah. Taylor Rapson is a fourth year doctoral student in health services with a concentration in implementation science and is a graduate research assistant for a CIFAR, ending the HIV epidemic project, partnering with local community-based organizations. Her research interests surround designing and evaluating interventions to promote equity in the delivery of services, specifically at safety net or nonprofit practices that serve marginalized populations. So Sarah's fun fact is that when she was studying anthropology as an undergrad, she joined an archeological dig in Scotland and found a piece of pottery that was about 5,000 years old. And I really appreciated the last sentence in your email, Sarah, where Sarah said, for some reason, they let my newly trained self excavate these pieces. Kind of amazing, actually, what a great experience. Um, and for Taylor, Taylor worked as a vet tech one summer and got to be involved in all kinds of interesting activities in animal care, including assisting with the delivery of kittens and observing surgery on a husky. So welcome Taylor and Sarah, we're so glad to have you. Thank you for presenting today. Um, for the audience, just to let you know, we're going to be recording this talk and posting it on the CIFAR website later. If you have clarifying questions during the course of the talk, please feel free to raise your hand or jump in. Otherwise, please hold larger questions until the end of the talk or put them in the chat and then we'll bring them up at the end. So with that, Sarah, please take it away. Great, thanks so much, Roxanne. Everything pulled up. All right, we looking good? Oh, I just I lost it. Yeah. All right. I don't know what's going on. We just tested it. One second. Um, I don't know what's going on all of a sudden. Taylor, do you want to share your screen? Okay, thanks. Sure, I can do that. Sorry about that. I don't know what's my screen has decided it does no longer want, doesn't want to be connected anymore to my computer. <laughs> it never fails. You know, you think we've been doing this for a couple of years now. We shall be like amazing. And the technological glitches unfortunately never end. I'm like, didn't we just do this like five minutes ago? <laughs> Thanks, Taylor. Okay. Great. Um, thanks so much, Taylor. And thanks, thanks so much for having everyone. Um, I think we're both really looking forward to um to sharing a bit about um this community academic partnership or there we go. Great. Um, this partnership um, that was aimed to identify and test strategies to integrate HIV and social support services to address social and structural determinants of health. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Taylor. 
Um, so just to give you a sense of what um, our talk will look like, so we'll start off by just sharing a bit about the study team, thinking about the collaboration objective, and then I will take you through some details of the year one planning project uh, with an overview, kind of talking about different project activities and some of our preliminary takeaways, and then Taylor um, will take everyone through what year two uh, has looked like. Next slide. And uh, we just wanted to first start off by taking a moment to recognize this really fantastic study team, both um, at UW and across the three community-based organizations. It's just a really fantastic team um, to work with. And um, that's a great, a great partnership. All right, next slide. Uh, so to provide a little bit of background to um, kind of frame this, uh, this project, so, we recognize that social and structural factors play a key role in vulnerability to HIV and engagement in HIV prevention and care. Um, and addressing these social determinants of health within HIV services and vice versa may improve HIV outcomes and health equity. Uh, Community-based organizations are really indispensable in providing holistic support to historically underserved um, communities and really provide um, a really a critical kind of partner in this work. Um, and there's a key knowledge gap regarding different strategies to support the integration of HIV and health and other support services, and particularly around tools such as practice facilitation, which has been shown to increase the adoption of evidence-based guidelines and improve integration of services and support um, practice transformation, as well as quality improvement interventions, um, which have been shown to improve integration of services with HIV care and HIV outcomes across a range of populations and settings. Next slide. Uh, so kind of with that background, the overall objective of this um, partnership was to, or is to support and enhance strategies to holistically support community members, address social determinants of health and advance health equity. Next slide. So I'll start off by sharing some of the activities we implemented in year one for the planning project. And these were really focused on identifying, prioritizing, and characterizing strategies which supported three community-based organizations' goals to enhance holistic services within their diverse but overlapping communities. Next slide. So this project, this planning project broke down into three main phases. Uh, the first was focused on appreciating the services that provided that were provided at each organization through just conversations with folks and staff. Um, the second stage focused on mapping service and program delivery models and data systems to identify opportunities for integration and understanding context. And then lastly, we create we worked with partners to create a plan for change to support community members as whole people. And ultimately, the overall goal of these activities in this process was to improve the ways that teams work together and how community members um, are sent, can be centered in this process. Next slide. So to do this, we used um, a variety of activities and tools. Sorry, Taylor, there are a lot of um, <laughs> clicks to go through on this one. You can do the next slide. So within each organization, we engaged all staff in developing a key driver diagram to build consensus around their overarching goal related to integrating services to enhance holistic service delivery an equity imperative and the drivers that would contribute to achieving these goals. Um, and this purpose, the purpose of this activity is really ultimately to build a roadmap to accomplish these aims, which identifies and selects different changes, um, which would directly impact their goals. Um, and also to understand the different mechanisms through which certain changes would help achieve that goal or aim. And this really created a foundation for our work moving forward. So building off the key driver diagram, we then brainstorm strategies for reaching these goals using the nominal group technique, which I'll talk through a little bit more in detail shortly. Staff then, go next one, completed a survey rating all ideas based on their feasibility and perceived effectiveness. Um, we use the resulting average scores to identify those strategies perceived as having higher feasibility and higher effectiveness using go to zone plots. You can go to the next one, Taylor. Um, and then we came together to focus on three ideas from these high feasibility and high effectiveness category, which is highlighted in that green box, and develop plans for action using a tool based on a NOLA Proctor specification framework. In the next slide, Taylor. And ultimately, and you can go to the next one again, th ultimately throughout all of these different processes, our team worked with all of the programs at each organization to create a process map, uh, to create process maps and review data systems. Next slide. 
So for today's presentation, I'll primarily focus on the results um, from the nominal group technique that I mentioned. So I wanted to share a bit more about this process. So nominal group technique is a structured process that combines individual and group phases to brainstorm ideas and build consensus. And this approach has many strengths such as separating ideas from participants, giving ideas equal consideration and equal voices to all participants, as well as providing a systematic approach for evaluating these ideas. And our approach consisted of five kind of main steps. Um, so the first step, you can go next slide, Taylor, um, consists of three kind of smaller steps. The first being um, the silent individual generation of ideas and writing. So this was part of the key driver diagram process as well as initial meeting with, with um, CBO staff. The second piece is focused on um, a round robin listing of ideas, followed then by the third step um, of group discussion of these ideas to clarify, merge, and add new ideas uh, into a final list. Uh, the fourth step, next slide, um, consists of individually rating these ideas through a red cap survey uh, focused on perceived feasibility and perceived effectiveness. And these outcomes were chosen and prioritized by leadership at the CBOs to kind of think through what's most important for them for their decision making. And then the last step um, is was conducting a go zone analysis and a discussion around how to prioritize all of these different change ideas. All right, next slide. So go zone plots, a bit more about these. So these were tailored for each organization and are scatter plots, which compared strategies, feasibility and effectiveness scores divided into quadrants using the mean for each dimension. So those black lines rec um, represent the means. And these were really used to inform um, prioritization of these strategies that were generated. Um, and as each strategy was associated with one or multiple primary drivers in the key driver diagram or the different conditions that uh, partners felt were critical for achieving their aims and equity imperative. Uh, we were interested in assessing how the primary drivers were distributed uh, across these different quadrants. And for most of the CBOs, we had strategies across all of the different primary drivers. Um, the ones that you see here are understanding community needs, communication with clients and community, retention, growth, sustainability, and mutual accountability within the organization data, as well as just a category for multiple overlapping drivers. Um, so we saw these often represented across the different quadrants. Um, however, strategies related to data systems were often missing from the high feasibility and high effectiveness um, and often deemed potentially less effective. Next slide. So now that we had a list of prioritized strategies from that high feasibility, high effectiveness quadrant, we wanted to think through how we could create action plans to increase the likelihood of the adoption of these strategies um, and their longer term implementation. And to do this, we adapted Proctor's specification tool with, um, with the goal of making the language and examples a bit more accessible. And this was very much an iterative process. Um, and we did uh, gather a bit more feedback on the tool to figure out how it could be more useful from partners afterwards. Next slide. So we took the Proctor domains and reframed them as questions that are a bit easier to remember and honestly, I just a little bit more practical and less academic. And we also added specific prompts in this process to think about equity in terms of who we are reaching and the overall impact. And I'm happy to share more about this um, for anyone who's kind of interested about this process and how we use the tool. And we use the tool uh, with for three to four strategies at each of the organizations. Next slide, Taylor, thanks. So that's kind of an overview of the overall process that we took, and I'm now going to present some of our preliminary findings and lessons learned from this planning project. And I wanted to put up these next slides so that you can kind of just get an idea of what types of strategies the partners came up with. Um, and these are three of those from one of the organizations that came from the high feasibility, high effectiveness category in the go zone plots that the organization decided to really focus on first. And so for each of the strategies that we um, that we looked at that were prioritized at the start, we measured acceptability, appropriateness, appropriateness, feasibility, and adoption using single questions adapted from some uh, previously validated scales. And overall, we observed very high scores across the four outcomes. So a score of five meant that um, 
that staff completely agreed with the statement. Um, for acceptability, the statement was, I like the idea of the strategy. For appropriateness, um, it was that the strategy seems like a good match for my organization's goals. Um, and even where we saw, for example, in this um, within this organization, even where we see the lowest mean feasibility score in that middle, um, in that middle uh, row, we see the highest score for adoption. So despite potentially some feasibility challenges, um, staff still felt like they were very much uh, likely to implement the strategy. Uh, next slide. So we did observe some differences across the three partners in terms of the perceived acceptability, appropriateness, feasibility, and adoption of their different strategies. For example, with this partner, we see a little bit more variation across all of the, uh, all of the outcomes. Um, and we see slightly lower feasibility scores here, but still very high likelihood of adoption. Um, so just to give a few more examples. And then next slide. And then these are some of the results from um, the third partner. Um, and again, we see a bit more variation across feasibility scores, but still high adoption, still high acceptability and appropriateness kind of across the board. Next slide. So overall, across the three organizations, we generated 118 strategies with a mean feasibility of 3.35 and mean effectiveness of 4.67. Uh, 33 of those strategies were considered higher feasibility and higher effectiveness. Um, and all of the strategies, all of the strategies, kind of as we've seen, were perceived to have a positive impact or higher um, effectiveness. There was very little variation in these scores, and this is perhaps unsurprising given the process through which they were generated, uh, but we did observe more variation in the feasibility scores. And we also mapped strategies to thematic clusters from the expert recommendations for implementing change, or ERIC, and the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, or CIFR constructs. Um, and the goal of this activity was to identify different facilitators and barriers of successful integration of HIV and other services addressing the social determinants of health. And the 33 high feasibility, high effectiveness strategies fit across 12 different CIFR constructs um, and across four different domains um, and within eight thematic error clusters. Um, next slide. So the table on the right presents the results from these 33 higher feasibility and effectiveness strategies. Um, and these and those that were considered higher feasibility and higher effectiveness mostly aligned with structural characteristics, organizational culture, and teaming, um, which looked at like collaborating on implementation constructs from CIFR. Next slide. So here we present the distribution of CBO generated primary drivers of successful service integration, uh, which were generated through the key driver diagram process by Eric thematic cluster across again still focusing on those 33 high high feasibility high effectiveness strategies and. The CBO generated conditions for successful integration of services um, included community engagement positive work environment. Um, data systems, inclusive and accessible, creating an inclusive and accessible environment and staff learning. And we were interested to see how primary drivers did or didn't match with these ERIC thematic clusters. And we did see a lot of overlap. Um, and just noting here um, that some strategies also fell into multiple categories. Next slide. So the most common ERIC clusters represented by the strategies included training and educating stakeholders, engaging consumers, and developing stakeholder interrelationships. And the primary drivers, which were represented across these clusters, um, primarily focused on community engagement, staff learning, and creating inclusive and accessible environments. Next slide. So ultimately, this process generated strategies which CBO staff perceived as acceptable, appropriate and, appropriate, and likely to be implemented, again, with a little bit of more variation with feasibility. And then further exploration of strategies that were really rated as higher effectiveness, but maybe lower feasibility might also help generate approaches to increase their feasibility in the future. Um, and when looking at how strategies map to see for constructs and air thematic clusters, we found that the combined higher effectiveness and higher feasibility strategies fell into four major categories, including uh, community engagement, building positive work environments and organizational cultures, whether or not through training or developing stakeholder and relationships and supporting staff specifically, 
Um, the, uh, the third category was optimization of organizational structures to use data effectively. And lastly, uh, the focus of on the creation of accessible services, all of which were important to improving health equity and addressing social determinants of health. Next slide. Uh, strategy, we found that strategies mapped well to the ERIC thematic clusters. However, attempts to match them with specific ERIC strategies highlighted limitations to this resource when working with complex programming and outside of clinical settings. And um, overall, the results suggest the need to test strategies that support system strengthening for CBOs and community engagement. So not just looking at the importance of service delivery, but also these larger structural and organizational level factors. And as we were designing kind of the approach for the year two, which Taylor will talk about, um, we were still working on all of these pieces um, and a lot of the testing for these strategies um, will take place in stage two of this larger partnership. Next slide. And lastly, just to share a bit of preliminary feedback from the partners. So we conducted a staff survey, which evaluated all of these different activities at the end of the, the planning project. And this consists of some anecdotal as well as um, some results from that survey. And although there was some vari variation across organizations, I wanted to provide just a brief kind of quick overview of what, what we were seeing. And one of the main findings was that partners really appreciated having dedicated time and support for this more visionary work and found that overall the project was most effective in ensuring people's voices were heard regardless of their roles and identities providing an equal opportunity for everyone to share their thoughts and ideas, supporting people's individual roles within the organization, coming to consensus on organizational goals around social determinants of health and health equity, and understanding colleagues' preferences and motivations better. Next slide. And there were a few areas of improvement uh, that they mentioned as well. We saw some mixed feedback on the effectiveness and continued use of the specification tool. So staff really saw its value in developing action plans and ensuring that many voices were heard during the process. But despite plans to continue using the tool and trying to implement the plan, it was difficult to do so and did take a lot of time. And we also saw some mixed feedback on whether the process for prioritizing, prioritizing strategies was effective. Um, overall, the staff reported that it was a very effective process, but some folks um, felt that the survey versus the, had mixed feedback on the survey and the go zone plots um, and how those kind of linked together um, and were used to make final decisions. Um, and ultimately, um, staff found that the process maps that I mentioned briefly in the beginning, as well as the key driver diagram, were, uh, were helpful in understanding social determinants of health and building consensus and identifying factors for successful integration. And with that, I will hand it over to Taylor to take us through uh, phase two. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so yeah, starting in September 2022, we started phase two of this project, really built on a lot of most all of the work that Sarah did in the phase one planning project. Um, and so the guiding question for this, um, for this phase is does practice facilitation as a strategy enhance holistic support for community members, address social determinants of health, and advance health equity? And so why practice facilitation? Based on what we were learning in year one, we explored other options for evidence-based interventions or implementation strategies that would meet the organization's goals, needs, and ideas for change. But we landed on practice facilitation because it's an evidence-based approach for implementing and building capacity for continuous quality improvement, um, also known as CQI, with ongoing support from an experienced facilitator. And it has been shown to be effective for a variety of practice goals. Um, however, one limitation of it is that it's primarily used in clinical settings and it's less known as effectiveness or its use at community-based organizations. Um, and so facilitators can really provide a lot of training in QI relevant innovations, as well as support creating and implementing QI plans and m &E capacity. Um, and facilitators also help examine processes and data systems. And so practice facilitation is able to meet our partner goal, needs and goals by addressing key needs identified through key driver diagram, flexible and adaptable for diverse and changing programs, and an opportunity to implement and test ideas for change from the planning project and new ideas as they arise. And so our aims for this, this part of the project um, is surrounded around three aims. And the first one is really to evaluate 
the effectiveness of practice facilitation and, and how well does it um, impact the reach of social and HIV services, particularly in connecting those services for HIV patients looking to needing social services and vice versa. And then secondly, to reduce disparities in access to social service and HIV services. And our second aim is to evaluate implementation outcomes, acceptability, feasibility, appropriateness, adoption, implementation, as well as the potential maintenance of practice facilitation as a strategy for integrating social and HIV services. And lastly, we want to identify the determinants of screening for referral to an uptake of social services among clients participating in HIV services. And so I will go for each of these aims, I will go into more detail in the coming slides about the project activities, but I wanted to show you this overview, um, which really looks at the different activities that we're completing across each aim. And so in the first aim, the practice facilitator is working with the QI teams at each organization to help design, implement changes through test of change, also known as plan, do, study, act cycles, as well as um, implementing and conducting a baseline and ongoing evaluation of the screening, referral, and uptake of HIV and social services. And in AIM-2, um, we will continuing those surveys with quarterly surveys assessing the acceptability, feasibility, and appropriateness of practice facilitation, um, as well as have examining CQI meeting minutes and work plans, and lastly, doing several focus groups per community-based organization. And in the third AIM, we will also do focus groups um, with more extended staff from, this, from the partner organizations to describe some of the facilitators and barriers of practice facilitation at each of the organizations. And this will be primarily guided by CIFR, um, and we will be paying attention to you know, disparities in reach and effectiveness for some of the key subpopulations at each of our partner organizations who are particularly um, BIPOC or trans or non-binary folks. So for the, the AIM-1, the effectiveness of practice facilitation, we broke it up into three main phases, um, the preparation phase, implementation phase, and lastly, the evaluation phase. In the preparation phase, we took this time to build and train the CQI teams at each partner organization, as well as reviewing and adapting data systems and conducting the baseline evaluation. Um, in the implementation phase, we are working with each of the CQI team to implement these changes um, through Plan, Do, Study, Act after working with them to design the key driver diagram, the QI measurement plan, and to really focus on what their QI goals are and priorities for test of change. And this is really guided by the model for improvement, um, which is the, the quality improvement tool that we're using, which focuses on these three main questions of what are we trying to accomplish? How will we know that change is an improvement? And what change can we make that will result in this improvement? And we found that this model for improvement has been the most um, palatable and easy to interpret um, at our community-based or community organization partners. And they've been able to understand and see sort of how that connects to their work um, and in a way that it feels appropriate and accessible. And then lastly, for the evaluation, we will be conducting run charts and screening referral and uptake of HIV and social services to track progress and to inform future decision-making about what um, what changes can we make? What other new tests of change can we try? And so to start off, we did a QI skill building um, with each of the CQI teams at each partner organization. Um, and we partner, we, the purpose of this is to bridge the gap between research and practice through coaching. Um, and it's really, we tailored it to meet the specific needs of each team, as well as the fact that these settings are non-clinical settings. Um, and so one of the things that we did was we formalized and standardized the approach to quality improvement it, within the context of each organization so that they would have a good sense of what quality improvement would look like at their organization and what their approach might look like with their team and by meetings, by agenda setting, by tasks and responsibilities, et cetera. Um, and we also provided tools to support each partner organization in the implementation of their CQI team, QI practice and QI projects. And this looks from giving them examples of run charge from racy grids and other sort of PDSA sheets and things like that that helps sort of organize their task and organize the QI team responsibilities. Um, and then we also tailor these skill building um, sessions to meet the specific needs and dynamics of the team. Um, what the curriculum details include is that we started off with the QI fundamentals, um, the what and why for change by helping them learn how to identify and analyze the problem, how to measure change, which is aim and goal setting and measuring change. And then 
Then the fourth session is plan for change and identifying solutions, which includes strategies to test and pilot change. Um, and then in the last two sessions, we did implementing and sustaining change. And then finally, we wrapped it up with sort of project management and team dynamics. And one of the things that was really interesting in this experience was um, in the specific tailoring that we did from non-clinical to um, community-based organizational settings is that the language is really important to consider. And so in, in a lot of the prior QI uh, trainings and data that we've seen in the, in the um, curriculum, it focuses a lot on clinical settings. And so they use terms like patients or diabetes care or just care in general. And those terms are less meaningful in community-based organizational settings. And so really tailoring the, the language from patients to clients or even community members um, was one way to make it more accessible. And then also um, not referring to, to it as care and sort of improving care, but referring it to more as improving programming or improving the ability to meet the needs of our community members. And those are just two examples of the ways in which we sort of tailor the QI skill building away from clinical settings and more to be more accessible and appropriate for this demographic. So some of the preliminary takeaways is that, as I just mentioned, is that the QI training and practice materials are geared toward clinical settings. Um, and this really highlights the limitations for these resources for settings outside clinical practices and the need to tailor them beyond just one particular setting. Um, and so then we also tailor the curriculum to be more approachable for each specific team, um, depending on their needs and their interests. And so some team had more managers on the team. And so they needed less manage, manager training and project management um, facilitation, whereas other teams are um, newer to managing. And so we spent a lot more time going over pro pro project management and, and team dynamics and things like that. And so each of it was tailored to meet the needs, the unique needs of each team. Um, and secondly, practices are interested and engaged in formalizing QI practice within the workplace. Um, they were very actively engaged in the training sessions and they were excited to, to learn about quality improvement and recognize how important it is and, and why it's valuable to their setting and to their, their, the needs of their clients and community members. Um, and they've already begun to apply concepts from the sessions in their organizations. And then lastly, the thing that was, that was really key for us is understanding that flexibility is so important when conducting these skill building sessions. Community-based organizations, especially the team members, are already so they have so many time constraints and competing priorities in addition to this new task of you know, participating in these trainings. And so we found that attendance could be inconsistent, but um, one way to really engage with them is to build in structured conversations and activities for the team to discuss issues and practice concepts more than just you know, participating in a lecture and just being taught information. Um, the opportunity for discussion um, among the team was the way that they were the most the biggest primary indicator of engagement, as well as the way that um, allowed them to really engage with the material and be, become excited about discussing issues or discussing ideas and discussing potential ways to apply quality improvement at their organization. So for the second aim, um, we're really evaluating implementation and practice facilitation um, and measuring these constructs of acceptability, feasibility, appropriateness, adoption, implementation, as well as potential maintenance. And so I just wanted to show you this grid that really just highlights sort of an overview of how we are defining each of these constructs, how we plan to measure them, as well as how often we plan to do data, data collection. And so for acceptability, feasibility, and appropriateness, um, those will be measured in the quarterly staff survey, um, which led us to designing a baseline survey. And the baseline survey was really just geared to, um, to understand the community-based organization staff perspective on practice facilitation and quality improvement and how things work at each organization as well as how we can improve our work together. It was an opportunity for candid responses based on staff experiences and observations and which will help us identify potential challenges to quality improvement before we start um, and potential resistance or confusion over its, its role or its value um, so we can try to address them as well as to improve how we work as partners and and how we can support them and come alongside each organization in this work. And then lastly, to understand what contributes to successful quality improvement at each organization. Um, because one of the things that we see a lot in implementation science is organizational capacity is, is a huge marker for success of implementation strategies and interventions. However, on many of these partner organizations, they may 
suffer from, you know, limited resources or limited organizational capacity, yet there's still opportunities for them to be successful at quality improvement and opportunities. And so we want to be able to evaluate that. And so we will be conducting the survey quarterly to track changes in perspectives over time. The baseline survey is a survey that was filled out by all staff at each partner organization at the baseline and then follow-up surveys will be quarterly. And they assess acceptability, feasibility, and appropriateness of practice facilitation, as well as measuring the organizational factors that may contribute to effectiveness of facilitated quality improvement. And then lastly, we'll ask start, stop, keep doing questions to continue to get feedback about what is working well with the partnership, what, what we can do differently and how we can better support them. One of the issues that we came up with with the baseline survey, um, and Sarah mentioned this when we talked about Eric, is that the validated metrics for measuring organizational factors, they do require some adaptation. They don't necessarily align as, as well as we would like to the needs and, of uh, partner organizations. And so one, no validated metric has everything that we were looking to measure. And so we had to balance how to use validated metrics as intended, but also not have too long of a survey or even a Franken survey with a bunch of questions from different surveys pulled together. Secondly, um, there was only very limited Spanish versions of, of these validated metrics. Um, and so the language of some of these questions, not only were they um, not translated to Spanish um, as, as, as often as we would like, but the language was not as accessible and required tailoring. And so it required a lot of work on our end to sort of put together this survey that really was accessible in language, both in English and in Spanish, as well as meet the needs um, of what we were trying to measure. And so you can see here from this table, um, the constructs in, in that were of interest to us. And so we really wanted to measure change commitment, change efficacy specifically to this intervention, as well as resource availability, looking at more general resource availability, but also specific in staffing, finances, and data, leadership, supportive of whether they're supportive of the intervention, are they able to affect change, um, as well as is there an intervention champion? Um, and then organizational culture and capacity, um, looking at shared values and collaborative nature of the work. And then our do staff feel empowered to make changes as well as is the positive place to work. And then also just looking at some of the QI processes. And so you can see here that we looked at ORIC, we looked at the change process questionnaire, and we looked at the inner settings measures questionnaire from the CFER to see which ones met the needs of, um, of the survey. And so together we were able to sort of construct a survey through these three um, through these three validated metrics to have the answer all the needs that we wanted. Um, and so one of the ones we were also considering was the short adaptive response measures, but we found that looking at ORC, the CPQ and the ISM, we were able to, to better sort of align our survey with the constructs of interest. And lastly, for the third aim, we are looking at the determinants of social services screening, referral and uptake. And through this, we'll have one to two focus group discussions per um, community-based organization with CQI and HIV services, plus other stakeholders. Um, and this is really gonna be guided by the consolidated framework for implementation of research. Um, and then we'll really wanna call attention to how determinants can contribute to disparate reach and effectiveness among key subpopulations. Um, across each of the organizations, um, as well as within each organization as well. So some of the key preliminary takeaways, I really wanted to call out attention to this one, which Sarah mentioned earlier when she was talking about um, the specification tool, is that our partners have a really strong desire for organizational strengthening. And this is something that we continue to see both in the planning project and now. Um, they're already so entrenched in their communities and work. And so not only do they want to sort of think about how to strengthen the organization, but they value our support in that as well. And so some of the examples that come up are staff safety, staff support, enhancing creativity and autonomy, standardization of processes, et cetera. And so the more specific examples of this is that they sort of fall into two buckets. One is that organizational management as well as the well-being of staff. And so some of the examples of organizational management have been staff skills and knowledge. So how do we um, support them in creating a better onboarding system or a more um, standardized onboarding one. Uh, what's appropriate training for each program or each staff role or even just overall within the organization? How, how do we establish standard, standard operating procedures as well as staff accountability? So performance reviews, time management, and then lastly, standardization um, is, has, been, has been a big conversation as well in terms of the training plan, program management, even just understanding 
better understanding how to collect and, and evaluate the data that they have. And then lastly, the staff well-being is another um, really important focus. <clears throat> Looking at staff burnout, staff safety, um, <clears throat> On site, as well as just their own um, barrier in their own sort of boundaries with with clients and community members, and then also personal development opportunities, team building, and creating more of a learning environment where where staff are encouraged to learn and to grow beyond their roles. So I wanted to show you two examples of key driver diagrams we did um, with some ideas of that they um, sort of suggested initially as like test of change or ideas they had, and you can see that both of them are geared towards improving staff support and accountability, or even just staff standardization and the unity of the organization. And they both have elements of, you know, organizational management as well as the, as well as the well-being of staff, looking at staff effectiveness, staff burnout, staff safety, standardization, as well as, you know, how do we make sure that our staff have this unified overarching goal and that we're all working together for the same purpose and the same, we're driven by the same vision. Again, standardization, <clears throat> safety, and then data. And the reason that this is really interesting is, you know, the staff are, or the partner organizations that we're working with are so, um, they recognize that part of, part of their ability to impact their clients and their community members comes from improving, it, you know, their, their staff safety, standardizing certain processes, et cetera. And they, they want our help to sort of help flush out some of these internal things so that they can go be better equipped to go out into their communities in a different way, which is why we see, you know, performance reviews as part of it, or even just both staff safety and community safety and recognizing sort of like how intertwined the, um, the internal dynamics are with their ability to, and you know, to reach their, their target populations and their community members. Some other preliminary takeaways that we found is that Engaging in this work well requires both built-in time to adapt to turnover and, trans and transition. And so these are all small organizations with high turnover. And so the impact is really significant and um, it's burdensome to the organization to have you know, many gaps in, in, um, in staffing as well as staff, staffing maybe leaving or transitioning to different roles. And part of that is that they have new program um, at, each, at each organization. And that is super exciting news, right? That they have new programs and staff are transitioning to help fill these needs, um, but it does create burden and it does create um, high workloads for the staff who are already there. Um, and so we need to be intentional about reorienting staff to the project and building trust because we may work really frequently with um, our key, our key, um, partners um, at each role, but then we don't necessarily see the turnover that's happening um, outside of that. And so each time we meet with the organization, it's it's important to be intentional about reorienting to the, what the project is and why it's important and how we're, we're there to help them and not just, you know, coming and just talking to them. And secondly, data access is a trouble spot for the partner organization. They don't own their data or maybe even <clears throat> have access to the back end, which really impacts their ability to use the data and require some adaptations as we continue our work with them and how we sort of measure things and how we extract the data and support them in this way. Um, and so also they, many of them want to build new systems or have sort of more in-house capacity, but they just don't have the ability to do that. And so they're, they're stuck in this situation of, wanting more ownership and autonomy over their data, but not necessarily having the ability to get it. And then lastly, um, which I mentioned earlier, is that most of the existing measures required adaptation and translation. And so um, it was really important for us to be mindful of research or academic language or jargon and goals um, and to make the language more accessible, but then also to also have translations in Spanish as well um, for our partners to be able to have access to that as well. And then, um, so because of that, we, our partners identified an inaccessible or inaccurate language for this setting, and we were able to really modify the translations um, of the, the, modify the language and the translation of our surveys to be more um, accessible for these settings. And our preliminary partner feedback is that our partners value having a space where they can resource share, support visionary thinking, and share lessons learned with each other. Um, they can feel disconnected from one another in this work despite the partnership. And so we have quarterly cross-partner meetings 
which serve as a, a really welcome opportunity for partners to share their experiences, their resources, and their ideas. Um, and they are looking for opportunities to collaborate even beyond this project and just share their resources and share their ideas and maybe come together for trainings. And so this is a really valuable opportunity for them to connect and to, to, sh to, to learn how to support each other even sort of beyond this project. And then in the effort to reframe communication, um, it was really helpful when we speak with our partners in less academic language and it contributes to better communication and our partners are able to feel valued and appreciate the good relationship we've built with them and their staff because of this effort. And the lastly is that um, the immediate feedback we've gotten from the baseline survey is again, the importance of reorienting staff to the project, who we are and why this is important. Um, sometimes it can be easy to just sort of say, just fill out the survey. Um, and, and have everyone be excited about it, but it's really important to say, like, this is why this survey is important. This is why we need you to fill it out. Um, please come, you know, and, then, and to share with them what the project is, why they should trust us, why they should work with us. And then again, how essential trust is when asking them, just asking staff to share about their experience, um, because it can be hard to share their, you know, their perspectives on their organization if they don't feel like they can trust us or they know what the survey is for. Um, and then lastly, you know, the repetitive nature of some of the validated survey questions um, came up a couple of times. And so it's one of the things that we're working on for future surveys is how to maybe reduce some of the repetitive, repetitiveness of it um, so that it's, we're not, you know, wasting their time or frustrating them with, with repetitive questions. And so before we end, we just want to take this time to acknowledge all of our partners, um, <clears throat> both um, within our study team as well as all the CBO staff, our partners at UCSD, at U also at UW, our CFAR partners, um, and our Birch partners as well. Well, thank you.